blessed morning it is. Amen? Amen. I just want to thank God once again and the congregation, you, my dear brothers and sisters, for giving me this privilege once again to bring you the Word of God this morning. And um, this is my third time to preach, but we can do all things by the grace of God. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. So why don't we turn our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. And this is the main verse that we will be um, tackling this morning as the message of God is brought to us. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. And I'm reading from the NIV. If you want to read it with me. Romans 1, 16, 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. For just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer, my dear brothers and sisters. And let's ask for God's blessing. Lord Jesus, we thank you, O God. Father, we thank you for this morning that you have given to us, O Lord. Lord, we thank you that you are indeed the, the one that never changes, O God. Father, you are the one that always remains and always stays, O Lord. Father, we thank you that we can put our trust in you, O God, and it is not futile, O Lord, because you are the everlasting God indeed. Father, we thank you this morning that you allow us to just gather together as a body of believers, O oh God, and that we can encourage one another and build up one another, Lord. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning as we meditate upon your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in your written word and that it may be made manifest in our lives as we hear from it, O oh God. Father, enable your servant to deliver your word with clarity, with wisdom, and with completeness, O God. And Father, may your name be glorified for you and you alone deserve it. And whatever we accomplish this morning, as we meditate upon your word, Lord, we will be careful to give you back all the glory, the honor, the praise, and thanks. For apart from you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So once again, the verse of scripture that we have this morning is uh, from the Apostle Paul. And that is, a very, that is a very famous verse of Scripture. It is interesting to note that many Christians profess to this verse of Scripture, and yet it seems to be no more than mere talk or rhetoric or head knowledge, if any at all. Sometimes I fear it has become an external, almost Pharisaic show of faith for us Christians. In popular Christian culture, and I believe the young people will understand this, will, will know about this, this verse is known as that 116 from that verse of Scripture, Romans 1.16. In popular Christian culture, it is termed as that 116, uh, or in other words, unashamed. And they boldly proclaim this, Christian artists, you know, uh, those that are, that, are, that are fond of this verse, they say, I'm unashamed. I'm unashamed, that 116. But I'm afraid that somehow it makes us become more like fans of the gospel rather than followers of the gospel. It's so easy to say 116, I'm unashamed of the gospel. Because the attitude for most of us Christians is that, you know, I believe in the gospel, I've been saved by the gospel, you now I've heard it, and I, and I understand its message. Don't just, but just don't ask me to share it. I don't want to be inconvenienced by it. Right? Because if it were so, then we would be out there, you know, just preaching the gospel of salvation that we have received. And this, this verse of scripture is very, very, very important because the great Martin Luther, okay, the author of the Reformation, this is what he said about this verse, Romans 1.16. When Martin Luther read this verse, you know, before the Reformation started, he said, Thereupon I felt myself reborn 
and to have gone through open doors into paradise, the whole of scripture took on a new meaning when this passage of Paul became to me a gateway to heaven. This is how powerful this verse of scripture is. This is what finally, you know, Martin Luther was a monk, but finally he understood what the message of the Bible was, what the message of salvation was, what the gospel truly is. But somehow I, I feel that we fail to understand what the apostle Paul really means or what it really requires for us Christians when we say that I am not ashamed or I am not ashamed. And that is why after much prayer and careful study, and the Lord has been impressing to me this, this verse of scripture, I have entitled this morning's sermon, The Power and the Necessity of the Gospel. Once again, the power and the necessity of the gospel. And I truly believe that the Spirit of God is impressing upon us this morning to understand the divine power and the absolute necessity of the gospel to our cause, to our faith. And all the more as a church, as we have embarked upon our race to a thousand, right? And most recently in our church anniversary, we said that we have, we have a relentless pursuit for greater things. But what is the greater? What, is, what, what, what are we in relentless pursuit for? Because all the greater things, all the re re relentless pursuit, that is all well and good. And yet we cannot afford to run a race unprepared and more importantly, not know the reasons why we are running for. As the apostle says to us in Corinthians, therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air, you know, shadow boxing. You see, in order for us, for each and every one of us to run and win this race, my dear brothers and sisters, we need the Spirit of God. It is not by human power, it is not by human might, but by the Spirit and the power of God. And so collectively, as a body of Christ, we have to go back to the basic foundations of our faith and draw strength from there to run that race that God has given us as a congregation, as a church. And that, my dear brothers, I believe is the gospel. I believe the very heart and soul of our race for more souls is the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Because without it, without the gospel, everything crumbles. Everything crumbles. Your faith, my faith, our faith is meaningless. If the gospel is not real, if the gospel is not held high within our church, within our congregation, we have got to place more emphasis on the gospel now more than ever. And this morning, I would like to share with you why the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is very, very, very important. And it, it is not just for un unbelievers or for those that are lost or for those that have not heard of the gospel yet but it is also important for us as believers as well. It is important for us as believers as well. And so I would like us to view this video. This is a, this is a modern take on what the gospel is all about, the main storyline of the Bible, if we can have it. This is a, uh, a video about you know, the gospel in four minutes. The Gospel in Six Words by Spoken Artist uh, Propaganda. So let's, uh, let's be blessed by this video. Thoughts, image, emotions, love, atoms, and potions, God. All of it is 
his handiwork, one of which is a masterpiece made so uniquely that angels look curious. The one thing in creation that was made with his imagery, a concept so cold, is the reason I stay full, how God breathed in a man and he became a living soul. Formed with the intent of being infinitely, intimately fond, creator and creation held in eternal bond. And it was placed in perfect paradise through something went wrong. The species got deceived and started lusting from his job and all list of complaints, as if the system ain't working, and he said, same breath, he graciously gave us the curse, and that said, seed spread through our souls, given on, and by the nature of your nature, your species, you participated in the mutiny, our, yes, our sin, it's nature inherited, lack of the human heart, it was over before it started, deceived from day one, and led away by our own lust, there's not a religion in the world that doesn't agree Something's wrong with us. The question is, what is it? And how do we fix it? Are we eternally separated from a God that may or may not have existed? But that's another subject. Let's keep grinding. Besides trying to prove God is like deep in an lion, homie. They don't need to help. Just unlock the cage. Let's move on on how our debt can be paid. Short and sweet. The problem is sin. Yes, sin. It's a cancer, an asthma, choking out our life force, forcing separation from a perfect and holy God. And the only way to get back is to get back to perfection with silly us. Trying to pass the course of life without referring to a syllabus. This is us. Chant, pray, meditate. But all of that force is spread cologne on the courts. But you can choose to ignore it as if something don't stink. It's like stepping in dog poop and refusing to wipe your shit with all of that ends with how good is good enough. Take your silly list of good deeds and line them up against perfection and good luck. That's life past your pay grade. The cost of your soul, you ain't got a big enough piggy bank. But you can give it a shot. But I suggest you throw away the list. Cause even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. But here's where it gets interesting. I hope we closely listening. Pulling to get twisted is what makes our faith unique. Here's what God says as part A of the gospel. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying. It's impossible. Sin brings death. But give God his breath back. You owe him. Eternally separated. And the only way to fix it is someone dying in place. And that someone got to be perfect. So if and when you find a perfect person, get him or her to willingly trade their perfection for your sin and death in. Clearly, since the only one that can meet God's criteria is God, God sent himself as Jesus to pay the cost for us. His righteousness, his death, functions as payment. Yes, payment. Wrote well, a check with his life, but at the resurrection, we all cheer because that means the check. Pierce to me, pierce to me, blood stains, son of man. Fullness of forgiveness, great passage into the promised land. That same breath that God breathed into us, God gave up to redeem us. And anyone and everyone, and by everyone out of you, everyone who puts their faith and trust in him, and him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is. That you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes. Life. This is life. God, our sin, pays everyone. Couldn't have said it any better. You know, God, our sins paying everyone life. I know most of us have heard it, but the gospel needs to be heard over and over again by all of us as believers. The gospel is the main storyline of the Bible. It is the theme on which every book eventually leads to. The gospel encompasses from creation to revelation, and the gospel proclaims that God created us in his own image to enjoy fellowship with Him. And yet, because of our free will that God gave us, because true love cannot exist without free will, and God doesn't make us into puppets, 
but with our free will man chose to rebel and therefore sinned against God and his law. And because of this we are subject to God's righteous judgment and we are condemned to hell unless the penalty for our sin is paid and we are forgiven. But God himself in his mercy and love sent Jesus Christ, fully man and fully God, to die for our sins on our behalf. And he was raised to new life in order that those who put their faith in him would be saved. And that salvation comes when we respond in faith in Jesus Christ and repent. Our fellowship with God is restored as we grow in grace and truth and await the blessed hope of his coming when all things are made new. From creation to new creation, from, from our rebellion to our restoration, that's the message of the gospel. That encompasses the whole Bible. That is the theme of the whole Bible. And that's why the gospel message should never be tiresome for any Christian, even as we have accepted it. One of the very most important things why the gospel is important for us, first and foremost, the gospel reveals to us the very nature and character of God. Amen? The gospel reveals to us that it tells us about the triune God that we serve, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the story of God with us. Christmas is right, it's right around the corner. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, about who He is and what He has done for us. And the gospel reminds us, when we hear about the gospel, we are reminded that God is our creator. First and foremost, we understand that there is a God, right? About the gospel, everything about atheism or not believing in a God is thrown away. Because the gospel proclaims that there is a God, and there is one God, and He is our creator. And He, he caused all things to be, before everything was, was made, He was. He was, He is, and forever will be. That alone, when we hear that about the gospel, gives us confidence already. Because we know that this God we can trust. This God we can lean on. Because He is unchanging. And we also understand that He is the great I Am. He is the Almighty God. He is sovereign. He is in control. God knows the past, the present, the future. God knows the purposes for our lives, the plans for your lives. But we also understand that God is holy and God is righteous when we hear about the gospel. And He is perfect and, and pure. Therefore, sin and God can never coexist. And we understand that when we hear about the gospel. And we understand that because He is holy and just, He has, he has, he has the justification to be angry about sin. But then we also understand when we hear the gospel, God is not just holy, righteous, and just, but He is loving, merciful, and compassionate. Doesn't that bring you back to Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7? When, when the Lord says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children, for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. God is loving, God is righteous, God is just, but He is also compassionate. That is the God that we serve. And we understand that when we hear about the gospel, my dear brothers and sisters, we understand the very nature and character of the God that we serve. That is why we never get tired of the gospel. Secondly, as we understand the nature and character of God, when we hear the gospel, we also understand the nature and character of humanity. We understand the nature of man, ourselves. We hear about our story. It reveals the nature of man as well. And if you understand the gospel, it makes sense. It is the story that makes sense. You know, with the advent of, of you know, the calamity that has been brought forth in the Philippines right now, you know, as humans, we see, we see the imperfection that, that sin brings about in this world. You know, we understand there's a lot of big problems that we face as humans. There's, there's, a, there's disease, there's poverty, you know, there's war, there's violence. And when we see the calamities that, you know, that we face. But when we hear about the gospel, we understand why there is pain and why there is suffering. 
The human condition is explained because of the gospel. The human condition is explained because of the gospel. Because once we hear the gospel, we understand that because we rebelled against God, we are a fallen race. We are sinful. And it is sin that has destroyed the perfect relation that we have with God. It is sin that has destroyed the perfect creation that God has made for us. So it is not just our own human condition that is flawed, but even nature itself is flawed. Now that is why we have all these calamities and everything. Because the perfect world that God made has been destroyed because of sin. In Romans 3.23, we understand that from the gospel. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we also understand from the gospel that because we have sinned, that is why no matter how beautiful the human body is, you know, some of us work out, we go to the gym, you know, we try to, you know, we try to get buff, get our six packs or whatever, you know, we, the advancement of medicine and everything. But no matter what medical breakthrough has been, you know, invented or has been discovered, we will die. We will die. And somehow we, we kind of question when science, you know, when, when, when you look at, you know, when, when you're in the medical profession or if you just study anatomy, you can see how, how, how amazing the human body is and how we can adapt to so much stress or to so much things that we go through. But even then, even then, we will still crumble and die. And that is what the gospel tells us about. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what else do we learn about the gospel, about the nature of man? Romans 3, 10 to 12, for as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. It explains our human nature. You know, when we make mistakes, we, we commonly say that phrase, oh come on, understand me, nobody's perfect, I'm only human. So, you know, in effect, unconsciously, we humans, we do understand that sin is universal. But somehow, we still do not understand the, the, the root cause of that sin. We do not understand the root cause of that sin. The Greek word for sin is called hamartia. Hamartia is the Greek word for sin. And what it means is missing the mark of God's law. An analogy for this is if you are an archer, if you're competing in the Olympics, you know, the only way that you can really get the highest point is to hit the bull's eye, right? Sin is mi missing the mark. It doesn't count if you're almost close to the bull's eye or like half, half a centimeter or a millimeter or what. Sin is missing the mark of God's law. That's why the Bible says that even if, you know, we, we follow the law, but if we stumble on one part of the law, we have broken the whole law altogether. So it doesn't matter, you know, when people say, whether you make a white lie, or a black lie, or whatever pastel color lie, or rainbow color lie that you want, if you lie, what does that make you? You're a liar, <laughs> all right? And we see in the Bible that, you know, liars, deceivers, and all, and all that, you know, are, 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 are subject to condemnation. When we hear the gospel, my dear brothers and sisters, we understand the deepest longings of our soul. I don't know about you, but, you, you probably you, you probably experienced that before we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. You know, in the wee hours of the morning, you know, when, when we're awake and everything's quiet at home and we reflect on our lives and we say, what's missing? Is this what, what life is all about? Even after all the success, even after all, you know, we've achieved the possessions that we want, the wealth that we want, or the knowledge that we want, but in, 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 our, in our own personal reflection, when we're alone, when our, when our spirits, when our souls speak to us, the gospel speaks about our deepest longings. And our deepest longing is to go back in fellowship with the God that created us. Amen. That is how important the gospel is to us. Amen. Now for the unbeliever, for the unbeliever, 
The gospel convicts the unbeliever of sin. When they, when they feel that sin is universal, now when they hear about the gospel, the unbeliever understands that sin is because we have been separated from God, because we have rebelled against God. And it opens their eyes, my dear brothers and sisters. That is how important the gospel message is. Acts 26 verses 17 to 18. And this is what, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ said to Paul in the road to Damascus. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We were once unbelievers, right? That's right. And it is because of that gospel that we were convicted of our sin and our eyes were opened and we received the grace of God. And that is why that hymn, that grace is so amazing because we were once lost and now we are found. Amen. We were blind, but now we see. And to the unbeliever, when the gospel is first given to the unbeliever or to the lost or for those that have not heard, it, heard of it, when they hear it for the first time, it always invokes a reaction. It may be good or bad, but it always invokes a reaction. Because as we said earlier, the gospel convicts the human condition. It always reaches out to the very deep parts of our humanity. Because it tells us of what we really need and what, we, what, uh, what God really wants, wants us for. You know, sometimes we're afraid because... You know, the reaction may be, may be different for, for some people. You know, all of us have experienced that when we share the gospel. Some of them may laugh. Some of them may mock us. Some of, you, some of them will debate you to death, right? But there are also some, once the Holy Spirit convicts them, that they will accept that message of hope, that message of salvation. And that is how, that is how important the gospel is. And what that gospel brings is that it plants the seed. When we witness to others about the gospel, it is planting the seed. And that's, you know, sometimes it, I, we, we've been doing the, you know, the, the youth ministry, basketball ministry, the outreaches. You know, there's, there's times when, you know, as a servant, when you, when you share the word and somehow you get discouraged because you don't see it, you know, in the, in the people that you're sharing it with. But I've come to understand that when we preach the gospel, when we share the gospel, we are, we are planting that seed. What we are giving people is that we're giving them a chance. We are giving them a chance and a choice. At the very least, at the very least, we are giving them a chance and a choice to accept God, to choose God in their lives. If for that thing we've done that, then we should be happy. And we should never cause to be discouraged because whenever we plant that seed, even if we've We've already finished talking with them or interacting with them. The Holy Spirit will continue to minister to them and continue to, to allow the Word of God to, 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 to grow and eventually bear fruit. And what it does eventually for the unbeliever is that the gospel bears the fruit of salvation. It saves the unbeliever. That is how important the gospel is. So continue to witness, continue to plant that seed, my dear brothers and sisters. Now for us, we mentioned it earlier, the race to a thousand souls that God has promised to us. As a church, as a congregation, what does the gospel do for the house of God? What does the gospel do for the body of believers that is the church? One thing, it creates a climate of unity and selflessness. When we put the gospel in front, when we put the gospel high, in, our, in the midst of our congregation, when we put emphasis on the gospel, it creates a climate of unity and selflessness. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. When we look back at the early church, because it was the gospel that they, they, you know, they, just, they just wanted to proclaim. Acts 4, 32 says, And all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. You know why they shared everything they had? Because they only had one purpose, and that is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
to all the ends of the earth. And that in spite of them being under the great Roman Empire. Under the great Roman Empire, but still they pursued on because they understood the absolute power and the absolute necessity of the gospel. And what else? I, I've shared this to you during my first sermon. You know, there's a difference between churches in the comfort zone and the conflict zone. Now, here in America, we're in the comfort zone. We don't have to worry about, you know, being persecuted or anything. Oh, well, we could be mocked, you know, in, in, in online media. If you profess to be a Christian, if you post something, um, you know, you, you've seen other people that comment and just mock, you know, our, our faith and everything. But that is nothing compared to what our other dear brothers and sisters, you know, have to go through in the countries where Christianity is persecuted. You know, in the Middle East, in Africa, you know, it's nothing. But when we, when we understand the importance and the power of the gospel, it makes us think that we are always in a conflict zone. That we are always in a conflict zone and that makes the church dynamic. It makes the church vibrant. We don't stand still. We don't worry about what colors should we paint our walls. We don't worry about what design should we have in front. Or what's the best, what's the best uh, technology we can use for our music system. You know, that's all well and good. But the gospel tells us that the church, you know, the church's primary role is to advance the kingdom of God. When the gospel is number one in our church, our congregation, we are more concerned with the mission versus meetings. We're concerned about people versus programs or events. We're concerned about kingdom advancement rather than personal advancement. You know, I think God is tired about us. You know, we come there on Sunday. There's an altar call. Lord, I failed you again, Lord. Let's grow up, Christians. We should be victorious. Amen? Amen? We should be victorious. We should be living out and proclaiming that gospel and saving other people. I mean, I know we grow from glory to glory. But come on, let's be victorious. Let's be the victorious people of God that God has told us to be. Amen? Amen? And here's a question that we can ask as a congregation. Holy Ground Family Fellowship of America. If indeed we know and understand and we put up the gospel up high in our congregation in the list of the most important things that we, that we need to really embrace. Let's ask ourselves, is our church a mission field or is it a missionary training center? Are we just ministering to one another? for the most part? Or are we training ourselves to minister to the people that have not heard about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, about the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, it's, it's all well and good. You know, we have our women's, men's ministries and everything. You know, we, of course, we minister to one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. But far more important is to advance the kingdom of God Amen. and not just our personal advancement. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 23 to 25. When we always proclaim the gospel in our church, this is what happens when we have newcomers, when we have unbelievers, when we have friends or family that we invite. 1 Corinthians 14, 23 to 25. It creates a climate of conviction and awe. It creates a climate of conviction and awe. 1 Corinthians 14, 23 to 25. So if the whole church comes together, and everyone speaks in tongues, and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. God is really among you. When we proclaim the gospel, the newcomers that hear of it, when we are always convicted about the power of the gospel as believers, it creates that climate of conviction and awe. When they come in, they will feel the presence of God. They will feel the holiness of God. They will feel the love and mercy and the compassion of God within our midst. And they will exclaim, God is really among you, Holy Ground Family Fellowship of America. It is not just in our lips, but it is in our hearts. God is in our midst. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
But more importantly, this morning, I wanted to challenge us because, as I said, we've heard about the message, we've heard about the gospel time and time again. We understand that it reveals the nature of God, it reveals the nature of man. It is, you know, it is, it is very important for the unbeliever, for the church, but for us believers as well, the gospel is very important. Number one, it reminds us. It reminds us of God's grace and God's love for us. It reminds us that before, you know, even before we love Him, God loved us first. We love Him because God, because He first loved us. And I wanted to ask you and remind you also, my dear brothers and sisters, when you hear about the gospel again, on a personal level, are you not reminded of the very first person that shared the gospel to you? Right. You know, we, 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 hear, we hear it probably from some person, some, maybe the first time that we heard the gospel, you know, we, we didn't take, we didn't notice it, we didn't, we didn't understand it, but somehow that very first person that shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to us, you know, planted that seed. So when the gospel is, is number one, we are reminded of that on a personal level. At this time, remind yourself, who was the very first person that shared the gospel with you? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that, you know, doesn't that make us just grateful for that particular person? Doesn't that make us grateful for the grace of God that allowed that person to think about us and to understand that we, we, we were worthy, we, you know, that, he, that he cared enough for us, or he or she cared enough for us that he would share the gospel to us in order that we will be saved someday. The next thing is that for the believer, it transforms us. It sanctifies us. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms us and sanctifies us. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. You can turn your Bibles there. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. And I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. For us believers, every time we hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it sanctifies us. It transforms us. Because we know that it is not by our own human effort that we are able to do such things, but it is because of the Holy Spirit that is at work in our lives. The next thing is that for the believer, it strengthens us and it humbles us. It strengthens us and it humbles us. Many times, the whole world has a bad rap for Christians. And they call us hypocrites, self-righteous, and sometimes we, we do fall into that trap, right? You know, sometimes we like, no, I don't wanna. I, want, I don't wanna mix up with my old friends anymore because they're too evil. They're evil. You know, we fall into that self-righteous trap. But when we are reminded of the gospel, we understand that they are lost. That they are lost, just like us before. And that is why Ephesians two eight and nine reminds us when we are reminded of the gospel. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God and not by works so that no one can boast. So once again, it, it takes out all that self-righteous crap that the devil wants us to fall into. It humbles us. It humbles us. Next, we are able to adapt as well. As believers, when we hear about the gospel, we learn to adapt like the Apostle Paul. Turn with me to Romans 9, 19 to 23. Romans 9, 19 to 23. When we hear about the gospel, we adapt to where the Lord has placed us in each of our own lives. So there's no excuse for us when we say that, you know, I can't really share in the office that I'm in because it's just too hard. 
or I can't share in my school because you know my, my, my classmates are uh, you know it's they're, they're just a crazy bunch or I can't even share in my own family because they're just they're just too hard to share with but this is what the Apostle Paul tells us Romans 9 19 to 23 and what does it say one of you will say to me then why uh, then why does God still blame us The Apostle Paul, in, in this verse, uh, in this verse of scripture, when we learn to adapt, I think that's the wrong. What the Apostle did was, remember when he was preaching throughout all of, all of Asia and all of Rome, the Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Paul said that to the Jews, I became a Jew. To the Romans, I became a Roman. To the weak, I became weak. You know, to the strong, I became strong. So wherever God places us, when we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, wherever we are in our own place, God has specifically placed us in our own places, in our, in our own places of work, in our own places of school, in our jobs, because we are the right person to share to the people that is around us. And whatever gifts or talents that God has given us, that is exactly the same thing that God wants us to use in order for us to adapt and proclaim the gospel to Jesus Christ. That is why we are we are made unique. Okay, no one of us is, is the same. Even Jonah and Micah are not the same. Even those twins are not the same. And you, you can see that. Because each and every one of us has a particular group that we can, you know, that we are always attached to. You know, as they say, birds of the same feather flock together. But those birds of the same feather as you, those are the ones that God has given you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what the gospel tells us, in that we will adapt to that. And we will not, you know, we will not make an excuse that we are in that place. It challenges us and drives us. It challenges us as believers and drives us to proclaim the gospel even more. Jude 1 verse 3 tells us that we should contend for the faith that has been passed down to us okay, once and for all. Jude chapter 3. And we must understand, my dear brothers and sisters, that this gospel message that has been given to us has been passed down, you know, with great risk and great sacrifice from the early Christians. The Apostle Paul, you know, the first martyr, Stephen, you know, they contended for the gospel in front of the Romans and the Sanhedrin. And that is what, that is what uh, the gospel does to us, to challenge us, to drive us even more to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. This is our responsibility and privilege as believers of the gospel. For I received and I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures or in fulfillment of the scriptures. I want you to I want you to look at that first verse. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. The gospel is of first importance. That is why it challenges us and drives us. What we receive, we pass on. What we receive, we pass on. If you play basketball, the worst teammate that you can have is what we call the buaya in, uh, in, our, in our dialect, right? It's the person who always holds on to the ball no matter what happens. He just doesn't want to pass it. And that's the worst kind of teammate that we have. No, as Christians, that's the worst thing we can ever do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we receive it, we're supposed to pass it on. When we receive it, we pass it on. When we hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ once again, we pass it on. That is how the kingdom of God advances. And that is how we show our gratefulness to God for the great salvation that He has given us. And that is why that verse of Scripture tells us it is of first importance. It is of first importance. It is of first importance. And one thing more is that it also allows us to be prepared. It challenges us and drives us. When we understand, if, if we really understand the gospel, my dear brothers and sisters, we will not be content 
with just one verse of scripture to share. I remember when Pastor Joseph Suiko uh, visited us in our Bible study group, and he shared a story about, you know, he was asking a fellow, uh, you know, a, a fellow member of the congregation on, you know, how, how, how is your walk? You know, how is your devotion to the Word of God? O kumusta man yung, you know, yung yung devotion, Brad? O pastor, John 3.16, nagi hapon. John 3.16, nung yun ta. And you know, that that really, you know, I just, you know, sometimes we do fall on that trap. I mean, John 3.16 is, is, is well and good, right? That's the most famous verse of Scripture. But this is what, this is what, uh, this is what the Gospel allows us to be as believers. We are challenged and we are driven to be more equipped with the Word of God so we can share effectively the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's not, let's not be content about John 3.16, but let, let us, you know, let's understand and let us be, let us be intentional, let us be, you know, let us be deliberate in understanding the Gospel so that we can share it effectively with clarity and with fullness to the people that we are we are going to share it with amen first peter 3:15 says first peter 3:15 but in your hearts revere christ as lord but always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect amen, amen? always Always be prepared. Always be prepared. How can we be prepared if we will only memorize one verse of scripture? Come on, come on. I was I was looking at YouTube about you know atheists, and you know what what the atheist was saying. You know what? You know Christians. Do you not know that most the average atheist probably knows more about the Bible than the average Christian? They study the Bible probably for the wrong motives. But they study the Bible probably more than the average Christian because they're always trying to refute, they're always trying to argue. But we study the Bible because it becomes manifest in us and the power of God becomes, becomes you know, it becomes real in us. And thereby we, the truth of God, you know, it becomes, uh, becomes the fullness of God within us. You know, as we read the written word, the living word becomes alive in us as we share with the people around us. And when we study the scriptures, when we really take hold of the gospel, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 tells us, you know, it will allow us to make any objection to the gospel become captive. It says here, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Jesus Christ. And make it obedient to Jesus Christ. <coughs> Friends, when you rely upon the gospel, when we take note of how important it is in our lives, it leads us to rely upon God and God alone. When there is nothing else but God that we have, we have all that we need. His grace is sufficient for us. And therefore, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible is the standard of a true Christian. How many of us can really share the gospel effectively? Let's examine ourselves this morning. It is not just for missionaries, it is not just for pastors, it is not just for evangelists, but it is for every believer in Christ. All of us may not become the most valuable preacher for the gospel, but because we are saved, we are all MVPs. We may not be MVPs, but we are all MVPs. We are missionaries by profession. Whatever profession we have, we are all missionaries by profession because of what we have received from the Lord Jesus Christ and one thing also what the gospel does is that it leads us to pray sharing the gospel and prayer go hand in hand one cannot be effective without the other one cannot be effective without the other let us follow the example of Jesus Christ Christ came down Luke 19 verse 10 it says for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost when we hear the gospel, we understand that we are on a desperate search and rescue mission for all the unsaved, unbelievers, for all the lost that is out there. So brothers, let us lead someone to Jesus Christ. Let us witness in every opportunity that we can, and therefore we can become effective as we plant the seed 
of Christ to the people around us. And let the Holy Spirit do His work. But let us do our work as well. I will end with these quotes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great evangelist and preacher. He says, When we preach Christ crucified, we have no reason to stammer or hesitate or apologize, for there is nothing in the gospel which we have any cause to be ashamed. Never lose heart in the power of the gospel. Do not believe that there exists any man, much less any race of men, for whom the gospel is not fitted. And let this be to you the mark of true gospel preaching, where Christ is everything and the creature is nothing, where it is salvation all of grace throughout the work of the Holy Spirit, applying to the soul the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This afternoon as we go home, or if we work or we go back to school this week, let us look around the people around us. The Apostle Paul said, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. If you go home to your neighborhoods right now, look upon your neighbors. They may have nice houses, fancy cars and everything. But we never know that there's a family there that is already falling apart. A marriage that is already breaking apart. Listen to the voice of Paul telling us, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. When you go back to your schools, young people, look upon your classmates, the one that sits in the corner alone during lunchtime or cafeteria, or the, the person that is always being bullied, or the person that is always left out in class, and listen to the voice of Paul saying, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. In our jobs, our co-workers that we always see, we say hi to them, hi, hello, we work with them. But we don't know that they're already suffering. They are in hopelessness and despair. Listen to the voice of Paul telling us, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. And for everyone here that has not heard of this gospel, if this is the first time that you have heard it, woe unto you as well if you hear the gospel and not accept it. Because it is the only hope for us as humanity. It is the only hope for salvation. Then and only then, let us truly seek to understand and value the absolute power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And only then can we see the fulfillment of what He has promised us as a church. In Acts 2, 2 47, it says, And to their number He added daily, uh, as, they, as they heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us bow our heads in prayer, brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank You, O God, for Your message of the gospel this morning. Lord, we pray that we will never get tired of hearing about the gospel, O oh Lord, because it is the only message of hope that matters. It is the only message of hope that answers all the, all the suffering and pain that all of us will face in this world, O oh God. And so, Lord, as a body of believers, Lord God, it doesn't matter if we've heard it for the first time or countless times, O oh Lord, but Lord, this morning, we understand the absolute power and the absolute necessity of the gospel. That you came down, Lord, for us. That you paid the penalty of our sin. That in spite of you being justified of your righteous anger towards us because of our rebellion, Father, because of your loving kindness and grace, you loved us and you saved us, O oh Lord. So, Lord, we thank you and we bless you, O oh God. May Lord, we just commit our lives to you. Lord, woe unto us if we do not preach the gospel indeed. Challenge us, O God, in our hearts. We thank you, Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in us that we may preach it to all the nations. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.